Let's, let's pray before we dive into God's word tonight. <clears throat> Father, thank you for uh, your word, that it speaks to us today, that you speak to us through it. We're so uh, incredibly blessed that it was passed down through generations to us. You've guided that and that your word is alive and active and that uh, we can learn things anew from it. Uh, Even things that happened several thousand years ago are still as relevant today as they were then. Uh, God, help us now as we dig into your word. Help it bless our lives. Help us to let it bless our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Don't shoot the messenger. That's a pretty common phrase. I think you've probably heard several times. Um, and it shows up in TV shows and movies and <clears throat> books and media. It, it seems pretty, it's kind of a well-ingrained aphorism um, in, in our society for sure. And in multiple societies, in fact. Um, and it, it's, it's pretty old. <clears throat> uh, and it even has been <clears throat> uh, parodied. Uh, about uh, throughout the years. Um, I, I remember <clears throat> uh, a particularly funny instance is in Monty Python and the Quest for the Holy Grail where the guy shoots the arrow out of the tower and it flies and hits uh, one, of the, one of the knight's messenger, one of the knight's uh, squires and it hits him and he goes, message for you, sir, and he falls over. <clears throat> yeah, that's it's kind of a, a pay, making fun of, playing off of, don't shoot the messenger. Well, uh, that messenger got shot, and uh, it was it's a, a pretty funny movie. So, uh, you know, this is really, it turns out this is a really old saying. Uh, in uh, ancient Greece, in 441 B.C., okay, 441 B.C., <clears throat> Sophocles, the playwright, he writes in Antigone, which is a Greek tragedy, uh, you may remember um, studying in you know, sophomore lit class or something. Uh, he, he writes the, um, this, No one loves the messenger who brings bad news. You may think, wow, that's really insightful of you, Sophocles, but I guess maybe back then it was. So <clears throat> that's the earliest reference I could find to kind of that saying. Okay, so maybe it was actually pretty revolutionary. Uh, but uh, you know, uh, 300 years, uh, 500 years later, Plutarch, uh, he's a Roman historian. He writes in his book, the lives of the noble Greek and Romans. Since the first messenger, so he's, he's talking about this war between Rome and, uh, and Armenia, okay? So that's kind of e- east of modern Turkey, okay? And they're, they're having a, a conflict. <clears throat> and the king of Armenia is Tigranes the Great. Uh, and so, and um, Lucullus is the Roman general. So, um, Plutarch writes, since the first messenger who told Tigranes, Tigranes the Great, that Lucullus was coming, had his head cut off for all of his pain. In other words, all the time, all the time it took him to reach the king to tell him that the Roman general was coming. Uh, since the first messenger had his head cut off, no one else would tell him anything. And so he sat in ignorance while the fires of war were already blazing around him, giving ear only to those who flattered him. That's what happens when you shoot the messenger, I guess, is no one wants to say anything else critical about the king. Uh, And, you know, it it seems like a pretty reasonable expectation that you wouldn't shoot the messenger because you want your messenger to live, right? You're sending a person to their king, and they're sending someone to you, and the idea is that you let them both live so you can keep communication open because otherwise you end up like poor Tigranes here um, who sits in ignorance while uh, everything burns around him. Uh, Shakespeare uh, says in uh, Antony and Cleopatra, so a, a, a messenger comes to Cleopatra to tell her that Antony has married someone else. And Cleopatra replies, Horrible villain! I'll spurn thine eyes like balls before me. I'll unhair thy head. I'm sure she really sounded like that. The messenger replies, Gracious madam, I that do bring the news made not the match, right? In other words, don't blame the messenger. I didn't hook them up. I'm just telling you the news, right? Don't, it's not 
I didn't do it. It's not my fault that Antony picked someone else. Don't unhair mine head, as it were. <clears throat> so, uh, and then, you know, I wasn't even planning to include this, but this morning, so I wrote this sermon a while back, but <clears throat> like earlier this week, <clears throat> because I'm no longer a procrastinator, I only put things off by a couple of days now. <clears throat> earlier, <clears throat> um, <clears throat> I read today <clears throat> this, little, this little nugget. Um, in 1962, two U.S. scientists discovered that Peru's highest mountain was in danger of collapsing. So naturally, they told everyone, hey, this mountain's going to collapse. <clears throat> when this was made public, the government threatened the scientists and banned the public from speaking of it at all. So they didn't kill the messengers in this case, but they did threaten them. I don't know what kind of threats were made, whether it was monetary or bodily harm or something. But um, <clears throat> So then eight years later, in 1970, during a major earthquake, it collapsed on the town of Yangoy, killing 20,000 people. Don't blame the messenger. Don't kill the messenger. <clears throat> and yet, <clears throat> so often, uh, you know, when bad news comes, uh, the, we, we want to take our anger out on somebody, and it ends up being the person who's bearing the bad news. <clears throat> so, um, join me tonight. Uh, we're going to be reading in uh, 1 Samuel. So you can open up your Bibles to there. And I didn't tell you a chapter because it's the first one. So just open up your Bibles to 1 Samuel and you'll be there. <clears throat> and, you know, Gordon has been doing a sermon series. Oh, sorry, 2 Samuel. Mm. Uh, it's 2 Samuel. Gordon's been doing a sermon series on First and Second Samuel on Sunday nights. And I'm just kind of continuing on. <clears throat> so if you've been here the last few weeks, then uh, you'll, you'll be caught up with, uh, with uh, what's going on. But if you haven't, I want to fill you in a little bit, especially to draw... Uh, on some things that are happening before we launch into 2 Samuel 1. <clears throat> so, uh, first of all, I really love First and Second Samuel. I mean, it is just such an interesting window into the socio-political life of early Israel and Judah <clears throat> and uh, how, you know, warring factions and, and kingship and how kings are made and prophets, and I mean, it's, it's got all the elements there of an awesome TV show, <clears throat> and uh, I, th I think it's, uh, it, it's more than exciting enough. <clears throat> um, and so, um, on, speaking of exciting, in the previous chapter, because in, a, in, in, in the ancient world, uh, Samuel was really one book, so just the it's just the previous chapter, um, <clears throat> we have the death of Saul. 1 Samuel 31 is the death of Saul. And Saul is on Mount Gilboa fighting the Philistines. The Philistines are this perennial threat to early Israel. They seem more technologically advanced. <clears throat> they even seem uh, more, uh, more capable warriors. And, of course, uh, Goliath, the famous Philistine, uh, was you know, so tall. And he's just, they're just bigger and badder in every way. And they continue to make a pain for Israel. And Saul is fighting them, and he's losing. <clears throat> and finally, he and his army are overrun. The soldiers flee the battlefield. Uh, the chariots of the Philistines encircle them. And Saul is wounded, and he knows that he's going to die soon. But he knows not soon enough. Because if nothing happens... The Philistines are going to capture him. And if they capture him, he will certainly be abused before them. They will mutilate and torture him for their own sadistic pleasures. <clears throat> and if you can imagine uh, the kind of... Uh, this is an honor-shame culture. So the kind of shame this would bring on Saul, on his family, on all of Israel, if this is to happen, well... It must be avoided. So what does he do? He asks his armor bearer, kill me before the Philistines get to me, or they will abuse my body. The armor bearer says, no, I can't do that. So instead, they both fall on their own swords and die, commit suicide. So there on that mountain <clears throat> on that day, Saul and three of his sons die. 
<clears throat> the Philistines, exactly what Saul thought would happen, the Philistines take Saul's head off his body. <clears throat> and they have his, his body and his head in, in different towns. They take his armor and they put it in the temple of their god or their multiple gods. All to show who, uh, who's winning this war. And then the Philistines advance and they take over multiple towns that the Israelites had, had taken back from the Philistines in this kind of uh, back and forth war. <clears throat> the Philistines are winning again. God's people are on the run. This is a disaster for Israel. And that's where we pick up in uh, 1 Samuel, uh, sorry, 2 Samuel chapter 1. <clears throat> After the death of Saul, when David had returned from defeating the Amalekites, <clears throat> remember that, David's defeating the Amalekites, David remained two days in Ziklag. On the third day, a man came from Saul's camp with his clothes torn and dirt on his head. When he came to David, he fell on the ground and did obeisance. So he bowed low to David. David said to, the, to him, where have you come from? He said to him, I have escaped from the camp of Israel. David said to him, how did things go? Tell me. He answered, the army fled from the battle, but also many of the army fell and died, and Saul and his son Jonathan also died. Then David asked the young man who was reporting this to him, how do you know that Saul and his son Jonathan died? The young man reporting to him said, I happened to be on Mount Gilboa, and there was Saul leaning on his spear while the chariots and the horsemen drew close to him. While he looked, uh, when he looked behind him, he saw me and called to me. I answered, Here, sir. And he said to me, Who are you? I answered him, I am an Amalekite. He said to me, Come, stand over me and kill me, for convolutions have seized me, and yet my life still lingers. So I stood over him, and killed him, for I knew that he could not live after he had fallen. I took the crown that was on his head and the armlet that was on his arm, <clears throat> and I have brought them here to my Lord. Then David took hold of his clothes and tore them, and all the men who were with him did the same. They mourned and wept and fasted until evening for Saul and for his son Jonathan and for the army of the Lord and for the house of Israel, because they had fallen by the sword. <clears throat> then David said to the young man who had reported to him, Where do you come from? He answered, I am the son of a resident alien, an Amalekite. David said to him, Were you not afraid to lift your hand to destroy the, Lord, the Lord's anointed? David called one of the young men and said, Come here and strike him down. So he struck him down, and he died. David said to him, Your blood be on your head, for your own mouth has testified against you, saying, I have killed the Lord's anointed. <clears throat> wow. So David gets a messenger, has bad news. He kills him. Seems pretty tough. Uh, so pretty harsh. I don't know, you wouldn't expect such a thing, maybe, from the man after God's own heart. So when we read this, or at least when I do, I immediately came up with three questions to ask about the text. The first is, how did Saul really die? We have the account in the previous chapter, 1 Samuel 31, and then we have this account in 2 Samuel 1, and they are different. There are different details. Did Saul kill himself, or did this Amalekite kill him? The second question is, is this Amalekite even telling the truth? Maybe he's lying. And the third is, why does he go to David? Saul's the king. Saul has other sons who would presumably become king. <clears throat> Why does he go to David? It's easy for us to jump to the conclusion that, well, David's the next king. Duh, haven't you read the next page? Like, come on. They didn't have, of course, the next page. They, uh, many people you know, didn't know um, that David was supposed to be king. So it's interesting. Why, why come to David? Uh, why not go to the house of Saul? So we'll, 
<clears throat> let's unpack these questions, and I think in doing so, we'll reveal some things for us to learn today from the way David acts. The first question, how did Saul really die? Uh, in 1 Samuel 31, <clears throat> Saul is on the mountain. <clears throat> he asks someone to kill him, and the person says no. In the very next chapter, 2 Samuel 1, Saul is about to die. He asks someone to kill him, and the person says yes. So which one is it, and why is it contradictory? <clears throat> well, one thing that's great about the Bible is that when the ancient writers are collecting sources— a lot of times they just put them all in, right? It doesn't, doesn't bother them if there's conflicting accounts. <clears throat> so sometimes you'll read that, and uh, that's okay. But I think in this case, um, th there's a really good reason, <clears throat> there's a really good reason um, f uh, for this. Um, and, and we'll get to that in a second, why there's two accounts. <clears throat> but either way, the, <clears throat> the killing uh, Saul asking his armor bearer to kill him, or this Amalekite to kill him, whoever it was, he asks someone to kill him. Seems like a kind of a strange request, doesn't it? Um, I wouldn't ask someone to mercy kill me. <clears throat> but uh, it turns out it's not at all a strange request in the ancient world. Uh, a thousand years later, for instance, I'm just bringing this up because it's the most famous example, is <clears throat> the uh, story many of you are familiar with, the story of Masada in the first century AD during the first Jewish-Roman war. The Jews revolt, Rome comes in, trashes the temple, puts down the revolt. Uh, Jews had taken over a Roman fort in the desert near the Dead Sea called Masada. It's, um, on this, I mean, it's in the middle of the nastiest wilderness you can think of. <clears throat> and it's on this uh, plateau, and it looks almost unassailable. And there's a fort on top and a palace <clears throat> and grain stores to last years. And they take it over. <clears throat> the Romans show up, and they, uh, they circle the, the whole thing. They build a wall around it so no one can get out. <clears throat> and then, uh, I mean, I'm sure the, the, the Jewish rebels thought they were just going to wait them out. Well, Rome's pretty good at building things. So they build a giant dirt ramp. Rocks and stone, they use slaves and soldiers, and they slowly pile up over the course of several months enough enough of a nice, steady ramp <clears throat> to run a battering horse up it. And they just break their way in. They're Rome. They can do whatever they want. They've got unlimited resources, <clears throat> the architects to do it, so they do it. <clears throat> so they've been sieging this place for six months-ish. And they break in <clears throat> expecting you know, a fierce fight. And everyone's dead. All 960 men had killed themselves. They hadn't killed themselves, though. They'd killed each other to prevent the pagans from getting a hold of them. So they worked out a death pact so that each one would kill another. And you'd only, each one would only have to do one, <clears throat> except for the last guy, I guess. But this isn't such a weird thing. For a lot of these people... Uh, it, it's better for someone to kill you rather than let the pagans get a hold of you. That's just one example, Masada. <clears throat> so here we find in the text, uh, Saul's asking the same thing. Kill me before they get to me. Can't let them have me um, alive. Uh, so, you know, in that light, uh, this seems like an entirely reasonable request. So why would David be upset at the man in this story here, the Amalekite who claims to have killed him. Why would David be upset at him if he asked him to do it? I mean, if Saul said, kill me, please, he's just obeying orders, right? He's obeying the king. Why is he upset about this? <clears throat> um, and the answer we get from David is that it has something to do with Saul being the Lord's anointed, there's something that seems inviolable about that. <clears throat> Which is strange if you've been following along in the text so far. Saul was the king, I mean, he's the king, uh, and then he disobeys God several times, and God says, no, I'm taking my favor away from you, and I'm putting it on David. 
uh, seems like killing Saul would be an okay thing, probably. Isn't, is he still the Lord's anointed? Apparently so, and apparently it's irrevocable. Even to his most bitter enemy. We'll come back to that in a moment as well. <clears throat> the second question, so the, the first one here is, you know, how did Saul really die? Well, it's hard to tell because <clears throat> we have these two conflicting accounts. So the second question, which springs naturally from the first, is, is this Amalekite even telling the truth? And I think what we can do with these two accounts <clears throat> is just line them up, and we have one that's, that's narrative and says, here's how it happens, and we have another one that's a person reporting something, and I think we can see the contradictory nature of it. <clears throat> um, and, you know, David just, just defeated the Amalekites. It, um, the text even reminds us of that, right? He'd, he'd been fighting against the Amalekites. <clears throat> um, and they've always been bitter enemies of Israel. And this Amalekite just appears out of nowhere. Some of the people he had just defeated. And he tells of Saul's defeat, and he car- carries the royal implements, the crown, the armband. Uh, and this just, this just looks really fishy, doesn't it? Um, it, it <clears throat> David, <clears throat> and, and just remember, David's doing the best he can with the information he has. David doesn't have the previous page. Right? David doesn't have 1 Samuel 31. <clears throat> David can't hop on Twitter and get a hot take. David can't even get on to you know, flip on the TV and get his preferable news source, right? He can't get a, a liberal take or a conservative take or whatever it is you want to see. He can't get any takes. He's just got to go on what he has. And so uh, David has to decide what's right based on partial, perhaps even false information here. <clears throat> so, so, okay, what do we make of this situation here? Um, <clears throat> is, is the Amalekite lying? I think so. I think he's lying. I mean, the previous page says that Saul asked the armor bearer to kill him. He didn't. <clears throat> and so what probably happened was this Amalekite came along and saw Saul dead, picked up the stuff, and decided to go to Saul's bitter enemy with a story. And so David takes him at his word, and that results in his own death. So why would he lie about this? Why would he come to David with such a story? Well, this takes us to question number three. Why does he go to David with the royal implements? Now, again, it's easy for us to think, well, David's the logical choice because he's the next king in the story, but we can't, we can't go there. We've got to stay in the moment with David. <clears throat> and so, um, you know, Saul is king of Israel. Three of his sons are dead, but he has other sons, and presumably most of the people in Israel thought one of them should have been king. So, <clears throat> remember... And you may think, well, surely everyone knows about this by now, but they don't. I mean, we, this is a rural backcountry place where news travels slow and by word of mouth only. And the only place where you can run a horse or chariots is in the valleys. And the rest of the place is mountainous wilderness. So in that regard, keep in mind that David was anointed in a small private ceremony. Many people may not even be aware of it. Most people in Israel probably didn't know that God had declared David to be the next king. So if that's the case, let's assume that this Amalekite doesn't know it either, because he probably doesn't. He probably doesn't know that he's supposed to be the king. What does he know then? Um, Well, um, David was one of Saul's officers. Uh, he leads, he's won many victories. You know, there's the song uh, that they sing about David. Saul has killed his thousands. David has killed his tens of thousands, uh, which, you know, Saul gets upset about, right? David's killed more people than me, or at least they think they have. Um, and so he knows that, that David is, uh, he, he's, a, he's a warlord. He's a general. He's a fighter. He's, he's a charismatic leader. He's got a lot of people around him. <clears throat> he's Saul's enemy, He takes the royal implements there. 
So why would he take the royal implements there? Well, probably because he thought he'd be rewarded, which is probably also why he concocts this story. Um, he thought he'd be the bearer of good news. And that's pro- uh, this is probably why he lies to David. He, that's, prob- that, that's probably the, 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 uh, the surface level thing. But also, you know, keep in mind that the, the writer of this text here, um, whoever it is recording this, includes bits of detail and information for you to connect the dots. This guy doesn't have to include, when he's writing this story about the messenger, he doesn't have to include that he's an Amalekite. Right? It's not an important detail, necessarily. Unless, of course, you've been reading along and you realize that David has just got done fighting the Amalekites and they're bitter rivals and enemies of Israel. So he probably also brings the royal implements to David. Excuse me. Because he wants to drive division in Israel. He'd like nothing better than for civil war to take place. But David doesn't give him the response that he's looking for, does he? He doesn't reward him. <clears throat> he doesn't march off to lead a revolt. Instead, David weeps for Saul, for Jonathan, for the army of Israel, and for the whole house of Israel. And then David kills the messenger <laughs> for killing the Lord's anointed. And we come back to this again. Something about being the Lord's anointed <clears throat> it, it, is, is greater than it's greater than any political dynamic, greater than any rivalry. And what this Amalekite doesn't understand is maybe in his world it's who has the mightiest arm, who has the biggest army, who has the biggest uh, treasure, the biggest amount of money to pay soldiers. But with God's people... The king is only appointed by God. And that is something only God can do something about. And until then, he's off limits. Something very special about this relationship. The king in the Hebrew world is God's representative on earth. God's divine advocate for doing justice. And you notice when Saul stops doing justice is when God takes his spirit away. And it's not David's place, though he is also one of God's anointed, to kill Saul. And it's certainly not this Amalekite's place to do it, even though he probably lied. But David takes him at his word. So, uh, you know, I led in with stories about not killing the messenger, and then here it is, David killing the messenger. Uh, David's act seems really heartless. Uh, why does he do it? Why does he kill the guy? I mean, we kind of don't feel bad for him anymore, right? Now that we've kind of unpacked this, we realize he's trying to drive division. He's lying to, to be rewarded by David. So, you know, we kind of don't feel bad for him. He kind of uh, did himself in, but still... <clears throat> it seems kind of heartless. You know, David doesn't know the Amalekites are, that the Amalekite is lying. All he knows is what he's, is being reported to him. And if the Philistines had captured Saul alive, they would surely have tortured him, and all of Israel would have lost face, worse than him dying in battle by far. Um, so if Saul really is asking for a mercy killing and a quick death really would be preferable to torture, then why, why does he kill the messenger? Because again, he doesn't know he's lying. Why does he kill him? I think, I think this entire story <clears throat> is, is what I would call an apology. An apology of David. Actually, all of First and Second Samuel is an apology of David. First and Second Samuel was written probably within about 50 years after, after David's death. Most scholars think it was written right about then. Probably during the reign of Solomon. And people have a lot of questions. Remember, news travels slowly. People don't get to see uh, a single narrative displayed for them through um, all sorts of uh, media outlets. <clears throat> 
The insti- this entire story is recorded for us to help the reader understand, uh, for us, to help us understand that David was innocent of Saul's death. And this is really important. But it seems like a minor detail. But David was one of Saul's generals. He fought a lot of battles for Saul and won them. And then Saul became angry at David and made him a fugitive. And then Saul hunted David through the wilderness as a fugitive. David becomes this warrior who ends up raiding towns and villages and has a whole bunch of men who will angrily, at the drop of a hat, go after people. You remember the story about Nabal and, and Abigail. And Abigail tries to stop David's men from making a rash decision. Um, David leads, I mean, he's kind of a, ends up being more like a Robin Hood in the wilderness. And then David fought for the Philistines. That's a detail I think a lot of us forget. <clears throat> that David goes and fights for Achish, king of Gath. Gath happens to be where Goliath is from, so that's odd. But David goes and fights for one of the Philistine kings. And he wins battles for him. And in fact, is even given a land grant of Ziklag, which is where this story takes place, from the Philistines. So now he's a Philistine warrior too. So David, and then David, we find on this story, ends up with the royal implements, the crown and the armband, the things that signify royalty. And so you can imagine an ancient Israelite who hears about David ending up with the crown, asking, wait, you mean David the fugitive? You mean David the Philistine defector? People would have wondered, at the, you know, at all these events adding up, people would have wondered, did David help the Philistines? defeat Saul's army and kill Saul to take the kingdom from him? Seems like a logical choice, right? Saul's been hunting him. David's a fugitive. He works for the Philistines. Of course he fought against Saul and killed him. It's the next logical step. People would have wondered, is David a usurper? Is David a traitor? Put yourself in the midst of this story, and you can hear the whispers and the rumors about David. And this story puts them to rest <clears throat> and tells us, reveals to us that David is a man after God's own heart. And so we learn, I think, three things about David from this story. And then we'll be done. The first thing that we learn about David and how he is a man after God's own heart is that David has every reason to march against Saul with the Philistines. But Achish, king of Gath, says to David, no, you can't. Some of my Philistine commanders, are, they don't like you because you're, you're a Hebrew, so you'll turn on us. They're afraid, but look, I know you're a good guy, but they don't, they don't trust you, so you have to stay. Now, David has never been one to follow the rules. He could have easily just gone anyway, taken a different route, maybe shown up behind the Israelite lines, impressed, impressed his um, Philistine king, Achish. After all, Saul has greatly wronged him. Saul is married to Michal. And, uh, sorry, David is married to Michal, and Saul had taken her away from him. He's got every right to march against Saul and destroy him. And we learn that even though he has every right to do that, first thing is David doesn't take revenge, even when it seems like he has every right to do it. And he had multiple opportunities to kill Saul. You remember the kind of funny story about David's hiding in a cave and Saul's hunting him and, and Saul goes into a cave to relieve himself and David cuts off the corner of his garment to show him how close he got to him and other symbolism. Uh, and it, uh, it's shocking how many opportunities David had to kill Saul and chose not to take revenge on him anyway. And I wonder what it is, the, the little things every day that, we, that you and I do, where we have opportunities, where we feel like we have every right to take revenge. <clears throat> yeah, and and I'm, I mean, just little things. Very rarely are we in the position of David. But, you know, uh, so I live in Abilene, and it takes, um, it, it, I'm so spoiled there. There is no rush hour. There's not even a rush minute. 
there's no traffic. And it takes all of five minutes once I get past Weatherford for me to, to remember road rage, my old friend. And someone just cuts me off. And the first thing I imagine is what? Run around and cut them off. See how it feels, right? Little cheap revenge. I think it might feel pretty good. It's bad for my blood pressure. <clears throat> but what are the little ways in which every day we, we, we feel like we have every right to take revenge? What can we learn from, from David? Or even big ways, like you see a news story occasionally about a family whose family member was murdered, <clears throat> and they stand at the trial, and they say, we forgive you, and maybe even advocate not for the death penalty. That's incredible. What amount of courage that takes. Here David is acting the same way. The second thing we learn about David is that David has every reason to be happy about Saul's death. But instead he mourns. And we learn that, second, David is honorable. You know, what are the little ways that we rejoice when people who, are, who hurt us get hurt? Do we enjoy seeing celebrities who are mean or petulant or even unfaithful get their comeuppance? Do we, do we get a tickle out of that? Um, what about the big ways? <clears throat> I mean, if you, think, if you think politics in this country are bad, just look at politics in First and Second Samuel. It, it is so bad. And David has every right to dance on Saul's grave. But instead, he weeps for him. And finally, David has every reason to reward the one who killed Saul, or at least claims he killed Saul. Saul is the mad king who suffered from evil spirits and fits of rage, who tried to hunt him down like an animal, but instead he has the supposed killer executed. So the third thing we learn about David is that David is loyal. What are the little ways that we show loyalty to God's kingdom every day? I think it's in the way we treat one another. And there are thousands of places in my everyday life to do that and to do it like God would want me to. And what about the big ways? You know, David is loyal to Israel. David is loyal even to Saul. David is more loyal to God. <clears throat> I think there's a lot of things we can learn uh, about David um, just in this one chapter, about how he is that man after God's own heart, the way he acts when everything is arrayed uh, that looks like he could take advantage of it. He chooses not to instead. I hope, I hope that the next time I'm presented with an opportunity to do something like that, to take advantage of a situation and look good, instead I'll lay that down. And instead, follow the way God wants me to, to go. The way David leads the way. The way Jesus leads the way. The way of humility. The way of honor. Let's pray together. Father, we are humbled to read about the story of your servant David and the way he was so loyal to you, the way he was so honorable when faced with uh, an easy decision, an easy win, and yet he took the harder way. God, we are presented with those types of situations every day. Help us to take the harder way. Help us to take the way of honor. Help us to learn this from your servant, David. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.